Welcome to the Tuesday Advanced Lecture at the Los Angeles Chess Club. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a game to show you guys against a master named Clarence Jung. This was played in August of 1992 in Houston Chess Club, which I was managing back then. Now I manage the Los Angeles Chess Club. I was black in this game, and my opponent was one of the best D4 players in Texas, and one of the best players as a white on against King's Indian defense. So naturally he opened with d4 and we contested this line many times. Both of us hit in the books and make sure we're following the latest lines and it really boils down to whoever was better prepared player. Besides that I was a little bit more talented. <laughs> so c4, d6, knight c3, Black could play g6, b, g7, but I played a different move order, which transposes. c6, knight, b7, knight, b7, they're all yeah. playable, okay. right? As a matter of fact, I will play c6 in a few moves. Okay. He played knight f3, I'll play g6. He played the g3 system. When I'm white and somebody plays King's Indian defense against me, I also play the g3 system. This is the most super solid line as a white to play. So we're both playing the line that we know best. However, for him, he was experimenting with this line. This was probably the first time that he played this line against me. And when you play some, op some opening for the very first time, there are a lot of silly inaccuracies that you could make. And he makes one of them in this game and ruins the position for the rest of the game. So after g3, bishop g7, bishop g2, castles, castles and c6. So this is a very typical position with Kings in the end defense g3 system. Another line that I employed later on after this game for many years was knight c6, a6, rook b8, and b5. This is called a Ponov attack, named after a player named Ponov. But at the time of Fisher and even early Kasparov times, knight bd7 was the most common move. If you've seen the World Championship match in 1972 between Fischer and Spassky, this is the move that Fischer played. So after Castles, Black plays c6 and White played h3. This little move is very important to play in order to not only create a loft for the king, just in case later on, but also prepare for g4, pre prevent a piece from coming to g4. So far he's done everything right, both of us have e5 and e4 queen b6 we're following book moves in other words at this time i spent about minute and a half he spent about three minutes so this is a theoretical line in this variation in the 90s mid 90s there's one move c5 that became very popular trying to mess up black's pawn formation but the correct move here is rook e1 and this was uh, still the best move back then 1992 and even today a lot of people are still in this position play rook e1 perfectly good move and e takes d4 i was trying to play a line that uh, especially a move in this line that is extremely tricky and it takes white really a lot of uh, nice resources and uh, ideas to find it which is extremely difficult and it paid off and it worked. So after e takes d4, white played knight takes d4. There's an interesting move in this position right now that Geller, who was uh, one of the great kings in the end defense players in Russia in the 1950s and 60s, he experimented also uh, Bronstein, who was a great kings in the end player played it and he won brilliantly in a really wild game. Knight, e4? knight g4. Oh. Knight e4 doesn't work because rook takes and oh, guard okay. this knight one more time. Knight g4. Now the correct move is really hard to find. What should white do in this position? Just save the knight, move it back to b3 I guess. If knight b3, that means he's opening this diagonal to queen check. 
So that would be a disaster. What else could he do? Bishop here fails to knight takes, and he has to take with a pawn. That means double pawns over here. That looks kind of not very pretty. So what should white do? Can he counterattack the queen? No. Knight e2. Which knight to e2? Knight c3. Knight c2. Right. This is the lesser evil choice for white. And in this case, had he played this move, black would have played knight e5, hitting this pawn. And how can white defend that pawn? Queen C2. And here comes that tricky move. Queen B4 X clam. This didn't, didn't happen. Hitting the undefended rook, and he is going to win the C4 pawn, and black would be better. Had he played this correct move, it still would have fallen into this trap. So where did white go wrong? E4 wasn't necessary. Bishop E3 or even queen c2 instead of e2, which is the modern treatment of this line is preferable. In the old e4 line, it could fall into this, just one of the traps that black could use in this position. So he didn't fall into this trap, he fell into another trap. In this position, after I play knight g4, he took the easy way out. Just take a knight. Just take a knight, queen takes. But this line proves that is also inferior. So what did black do? Every move with a threat. Bishop takes, threaten here. He brought the queen back. So far so good. And now, 95 exclam. What is the threat? Right, I could take this pawn. I could play bishop here and hit this pawn one more time. And he doesn't have b3 because of bishop takes. So white is really tied up here. There is just no good move for him in this position. What can he do? King h2 fails to bishop takes also. King f1? Yeah, king f1 is possible. King f1. Then bishop to uh, e6. Well, with king f1, black wins the b pawn with queen b4. And how can white defend the b1 one more time? b3 is the only move, but b3 is also no good because of he loses the c4 pawn. So what did he do? He doesn't want to... This guy is, by the way, characteristically very materialistic. Some people, they're just not willing to sacrifice a pawn and it's compensation to go for attack. So he played the only bad move that saves and doesn't lose anything. Bishop e3. But trouble with this move is that after I play bishop takes, he cannot take with the queen because c pawn falls, b2 pawn falls, so he had to take with the pawn. And after bishop takes, pawn takes. Double pawn. Th these are double pawns are usually good in the center, but these are double isolated pawns. So why can't you and take there's a beautifully guard. What is it? So now all you have to do is improve my position. Because he cannot defend the c pawn one more time, I'll play queen b4, and the pawn is mine already. Bishop e6. Unless, we these bishop where? Bishop e6. On bishop e6, he plays b3. But with queen here, he cannot play b3 because I'm also hitting the knight. So on queen b4, he played rook ed1. So he's going after this pawn. So I can take the knight anytime, right? I mean this pawn, and give him this pawn. And that's good continuation for black. After all, this is a weak pawn. Exposed on a half open knight, file. The knight's covering that pawn. Right. So this is a case of you see a good move, then you look for a better one. Bishop e6. The pawn is still guarded, and if he ever kicks my queen, then I could take here. So I'm gonna force him to waste a move with a3, which he did played a3 and now of course queen c4 queen c4 knight takes c4 now he cannot even take the d pawn it's guarded and these both of these pawns are also hanging 
So at this point, I analyze the position as a one game for black. White just has not only uh, he's a pawn down, but he has no compensation for the pawn. And he's going to lose another pawn, maybe. So I played b3, kick the knight. Knight takes e3. I'm forking both of these also. So the game is won. He played rook takes d6. Knight takes bishop is a good move. Again, while he cannot double up on the foul, challenge his rook. So rook a d8. You see, he only has one option pretty much, and that is to take. Well, he played e5, but this pawn may look like a great pass pawn, but eventually will be surrounded and captured. Can you take the e3 pawn? I can take it anytime, right. I can take this, then take this, then take this. So I'll play rook takes d6, pawn takes. And of course, the fewer pieces on the board, the better off I would be. So I'll play rook d8. No, notice he still cannot play rook d1. I didn't rush with this knight. I wanted to waste a move and then capture the bishop. It's enjoying its position for now. So after rook d8, he played knight e4. Okay, nice move. Guards the pawn for the moment. Okay, black to play. And black has a winning tactics in this position. I don't even have to bother to take that pawn. Oh, just knight takes bishop. Followed by? Followed by bishop to d5. Exactly. Knight takes bishop. King takes. King takes. Bishop to d5. Pin it and win it. Win it. Win it. Three, the knight is lost. Yeah. If it does, doesn't matter if he defends with the rook or f5. with the king, f5. Oh. Well, he actually played it. He played king f3, and when I played f5, a master should have seen this resign long time ago. But he actually played, played it, and at this point, he finally resigned. So you see King's Indian defense is a very tricky line. And even as black, this game took 25 moves, which is a miniature. Any game on 25 moves or under, it's called miniature. There's a lot of tricks in this line. It's a very poisonous line. And if you are a tactical player, I highly recommend it. Initially, it takes some time to become familiar with the subtleties of this line, and there are so many of them. But after a while, you will appreciate uh, that you played this line. Okay, hope you enjoyed it. That was a quick game in Kingsley and Defense as black against Master Clarence Young.